Kevin's challenge this week. As we start worship today, we wanted to give you a few minutes, get settled, just prepare your hearts for worship. So there's going to be some questions on the screen. Pay attention to those. Think about the people that you were connecting with this week uh, and let uh, the Lord just bring them to your mind, give them to the Lord, pray for them. Uh, let's go to worship together. As we prepare for worship this morning, we find ourselves in unexpected and uh, uncertain times, but we still look to our great and glorious God. The prophet Jeremiah writes in his 30th, 31st chapter, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. As we prepare for worship, would you pray with me? Father God, we worship you as our God, as our King. And Jesus, we look to your greatness, to your sacrifice. And Holy Spirit, as we come together to worship you, please open our minds and our hearts to the grace that you would have for us this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together. Good morning. This is a song about another world-changing event that changed the course of history. It was the pouring out of God's Spirit. And the flow of that Spirit... It's touching all of history and even us to this moment. There is power, power here in the sound. Calling for 
Isn't it a comfort to know that we are together as we have been navigating these interesting weeks? It's been so exciting and um, faith building to see the body of Christ working together. Um, many of you took our seven challenge. Um, maybe if you remember last week, Kevin asked you to choose seven people to reach out to and care for because we are not alone. Uh, we are the body of Christ, and we are given the task of caring for one another. Uh, so I hope you took that challenge seriously, that you use some of these questions to get to know uh, the seven people on your list. And I would encourage you uh, to continue to reach out to those seven. Um, I saw some really fun things. I saw interesting filters being used um, to send silly videos. Um, Somebody told me, I think I was one of Barry Norcross's seven. He called me today. I was a little jealous. I wasn't one of Barry Norcross's seven, um, but I loved seeing the body of Christ at work. And so I encourage you to, to keep reaching out to your seven. If you only got to four of your seven, reach out to the other three um, and take that challenge seriously so the body of Christ can be continued to be lifted up and encouraged. Um, the other thing that happened this week is our shepherd leaders had the idea to create an online community, really a sharing community that we could share prayer requests, share um, thoughts, ideas, resources. Um, and so if you are not connected to that online community, uh, find us on Facebook. We are Judson Church Online Community. You uh, can invite others to join us. Um, they do um, have to be approved, so it's a private group so we can share some personal information. Um, but some of the things that we were talking about on there this week is just what we have learned through this experience. Um, and so we asked Mike Carson, he's going to join us this morning and just share a little bit of what he has learned um, through this experience. So morning, Mike. Good morning. Hey, Judson family. Um, I hope you're taking this time to enjoy your family uh, and everything. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you and tell you some things that I've noticed this week and over the past couple weeks. Uh, Kevin asked me to talk about what I've noticed and everything and I started thinking of all these different things and you know as as the weeks go on things have progressed and changed and everything and I've noticed a lot of really really good things coming out of a lot of what seems to be bad things. Um, we've noticed a ton of families, um, you know, being together and just enjoying their time together, uh, you know, during this lockdown when they can't go to work and everything. Um, there's there's a lot of good in this, um, regardless of the challenges that we have. 
uh, we're seeing a lot of people in the church connecting in many different ways. Like Jody just said, you know, we've got the online community. Um, we've got community groups that are meeting virtually. Um, I'm going to go back to Mike here. And he's going to resume uh, sharing about a community during uh, this time. So Mike, take it away. Okay, so I left off about, you know, what I've noticed in, in families and, and people in the church connecting in different ways. And I believe where the sound got cut off was, uh, I mentioned our community group um, had actually been meeting virtually. And I've, I've noticed that other community groups have also been meeting virtually. And I think it's wonderful when, you know, everybody's connecting in all these different ways. Um, we're living in a digital era where everyone can stay connected in a multitude of ways. So I'd like to really encourage you guys and gals to, you know, just stay connected. Somehow you can FaceTime, you can, you know, do all all these video chats um, are available, Google Hangouts, you know, any any way that you can stay connected, try and do it. Um, there's there's no reason that as a church we cannot meet still even with each other and interact um, virtually. So, um, you know, some things that that Kevin, you know, asked me to, to speak on and um, are things that I noticed. And, you know, right now we're literally living in a, a biblical sized plague right now. Um, let's just let's just face it. Um, but the one thing that I'd like to encourage everyone through this is God remains in control 100 percent. He knew that this was going to happen. He knows the outcome and, and we have to trust in him and have keep our faith, you know, as, as a Christian community. And, you know, it's it's not all bad. It's a great time for opportunity to make some positive change. Um, we're seeing this all over the world and in different aspects. Um, we can choose to to react to the situation or we can choose to act on the situation. And I'd like to really encourage everyone not to react, but to act and and. You know, there's there's a lot of people out there that are hurting. There's organizations that are hurting. You know, there's a lot of them that are thriving as well through this. And, you know, we've got people, you know, that are still working, but there's also a lot of people who are not working. There's people who have lost their jobs. And, you know, if if you're in any of those situations, no matter what it is, you know, you're smart. God gave you a lot of talent. And no matter whether you think you're smart or you think you have talent, you do. And, you know, the time is now for us to get off our butts and act and not react. So I really like to encourage you to be proactive. You know, if, if you're, uh, you know, scared of whether you're going to lose your job, you know, talk, keep in contact with everyone at your at your work, you know. Um, be proactive, come up with ideas on how to help in, you know, make things sustainable for the, for the company and to keep your job, you know, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways that we can act. Uh, and that's just one example. Um, in a few moments, Dave is going to talk about fear. And this is something that I've, I've heard a lot about. I've seen it. I've, I've, you know, started to wonder about it myself. And, uh, a recent book I read described fear as an acronym for false events appearing real. And now I'm not saying that, that all this that's going on isn't real, but fear brings worry and worry does not add a single day to our lives. We have that in God's word and God did not create us to worry or to have fear. You know, that's something that we learn. We're not born fearing. Um, you know, God does not want us to fear and, you know, it's, it's not his plan for us to fear and worry. So, you know, act, be proactive, you know, pray, prayer works so well. And, you know, just, just a couple of days ago, I, I had a concern and I was wondering about, you know, 
whether whether something was going to happen. And I shared that with a couple of my friends in, in church and, and, you know, they started praying. And you know what? Hours later, that situation completely turned around. And I know for a fact it was an answer to prayer. Um, you know, so pray for the church, pray for our country, pray for the entire world through all this situation. There's there's a lot going on, and I just like to really encourage you to to stay positive. You know, turn off the news. You know, just stop watching TV. You know, go and do something positive. You know, use your time that we have now to actually do something that is positive change, you know, in some way, whether it's in one person's life or the world, it doesn't matter. Change is change. And as long as it's positive, it's a great thing. So I just wanted to say that. And, you know, I'm really glad to encourage you. And now back to our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> Anxiety, fear, and panic. I will shut down business schools, places of worship, and sports events. I will cause economic turmoil. Um, I will bring together neighbors, restore the family unit. I will bring dinner back to the kitchen table. I will help people slow down their lives and appreciate what really matters. I will teach my children to rely on me and not the world. I will teach my children to trust me and not for money and material resources. 
We um, enjoy asking kids questions because as you can see, they are honest and unfiltered. Um, I love that Cammie's enjoying the no drama in her house, um, but let's be careful not to desire to rush back to what is normal. Let's take a minute and think about what is precious to these kids. And more importantly, let's um, listen to the Almighty because he is speaking. He is um, drawing us near to him. Um, remember our heart's allegiance doesn't belong to this world, but to him and him alone. Good morning, everyone. Well, we are living in very interesting, unprecedented times like we've never seen before. I know that many of you have been looking at this economic crisis, the health crisis, and wondering what in the world is going on. How is it going to end? You know, oftentimes we don't know. And sometimes the uncertainty and not knowing how something's going to happen creates a lot of fear in our lives. Fear is a terrible master. Sometimes we're afraid of what might happen. We start thinking about things, all the things that could happen, and we got to be very careful not to let fear control our lives. This last week, I talked to several people who have lost their jobs, several others who are worried about losing their jobs. Others are worried about how are they going to pay their mortgage, how are they going to pay their car payment, their health insurance, their deductible, how are they going to buy food, taxes, utilities, even gasoline. There are all kinds of fear that are, are bombarding us right now, and we, gotta be a, we cannot let fear control our lives. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, back in the Great Depression, he said these words, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But I like what Paul even said better. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, here's what the Apostle Paul says. But God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. See, what Paul was really saying, fear doesn't come from God. Fear comes from the enemy. The enemy is always looking to put fear into your life, to plant those seeds of doubt in your life, and let fear control your life and paralyze us. But what Paul is saying, fear doesn't come from God. But he does not give you a spirit of fear, but he gives you power. The word power is the word dunamis or dynamite. It has the power to change our lives from within. How we think, how we act, how we respond. The power of God rules and reigns in each one of us. So the good news today, we have the power of God working in us. And we can get through this, no matter what the crisis, with the power of God, depending on him. But Paul also says not just power, we have love. We have God's love in, us, in our hearts, in our lives. Let us love one another. Let us love others the way we are, want to be loved ourselves. So Paul says love, the love of God should reign and rule in our lives. How we can help people. At times like this, look for how you can encourage people, be generous to people. There's nothing greater than giving to others. It helps not only them, but it helps you too. But Paul says this, God has not given a spirit of fear, but a power, love. And the third thing is a sound mind. It means sound judgment, wisdom, wisdom of how to make the right decisions, how to look at life from God's perspective. See, all of that is found in this one verse. It's a great verse today for you to memorize, to meditate on, to just look and think about that verse today. Let it control your mind and your, and your thoughts today. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and what? He's given the power, power and love and a sound mind. I knew I'd get it right. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Think about those words today. Let those words encourage your heart today in the midst of where we are. In these unprecedented times. Let that verse com control your thoughts and mind today. May God bless you. Thank you. I'm going to be reading Luke chapter 22, verses 7 through 15. The day had come for the festival of unleavened bread, and it was time to kill the Passover lambs. So Jesus said to Peter and John, Go and prepare the Passover meal for us to eat. But they asked, Where do you want us to prepare it? Jesus told them, As you go into the city, you will meet a man carrying a jar of water. Follow him into the house and say to the owner, Our teacher wants to know where he can eat the Passover meal with his disciples. The owner will take you upstairs and show you a large room ready for you to use. Prepare the meal there. Peter and John left, 
Then they found everything just as Jesus had told them, and they prepared the meal. When the time came for Jesus and the apostles to eat, he said to them, I have very much wanted to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. Well, good morning, Judson. Sorry for the technical difficulties earlier, but, um, you know, it's all new to us, so we're learning as we go. Uh, thanks for everyone who shared. I, I wanted to begin just by talking about three things I heard to this week, and that, that'll bring you into the thoughts that I have uh, this morning. The first thing I heard such great things about everyone connecting with one another, I'm, that just is so encouraging because the church does not stop just because um, uh, we can't be together. And so those encouraging words that you give to one another and the things that you've done for one another makes the church the church. So thank you for that. Um, the second thing I heard was this commercials, which um, were saying we're all in this together and uh, different people, different um, actors and, and uh, celebrities and all. And suddenly it occurred to me that was our theme for last year. We're all in this together. We prepared for this time last year. And so we were reminded we are all in this together. And you guys are doing a great job in, in showing that in so many different ways. The third thing I heard this week has really sprung my thoughts this morning. And I kept on hearing, I can't wait till things get back to normal. I can't wait till things get back to normal. And my mind went, do we really want that? Do we really want things to go back to normal? So, um, I got to uh, reading the scriptures and I came to this passage where Jesus is setting up Passover time with his disciples. And as he's setting that time up with his disciples, um, he said something that's always fascinated me. I've earnestly desired to spend this time with you, this Passover meal with you. And I've always wondered why that is. And so we need to go back and hit three different points here, three different uh, events, I think, that will kind of bring us back to the, to the question, do we really want things back to normal? The Passover meal itself was a meal that celebrated what God had done in the life of Israel. Uh, if you know your biblical, the biblical story, uh, God's people were crying out to God because they were slaves and they wanted freedom. And so God heard their cries and called and sent Moses to Pharaoh to say, let my people go. Pharaoh said, I don't think I'm going to do that. I got a, we got a good thing going on here. And so God sent a series of plagues um, to the Egyptians and flies and frogs and water to blood and lots of different things that um, were just terrible to go through. And yet they held firm and not letting God's people go. So they came to the last of the plagues, pandemic, if you will, in which the um, the, the angel of death would go through all of Egypt and kill the firstborn son in every household. Now, the way in which the Israelites were protected was that they were to go and kill a lamb and eat the lamb for dinner and then take the blood from the lamb and put it on the doorposts, both the sides and on top. And the angel of death would see the blood and pass over it. And the next day, Pharaoh said, you guys got to get out of here. You, I, we don't need you as slaves anymore. This is terrible. And so the Israelites left. Not only did they leave, the Egyptians gave them gifts and sent them away. But what did they go away to? They went through all these plagues. Did they go back to life as normal? Or did they walk into a new life, a life of freedom for them, freedom from the slavery that they saw themselves in? Well, that's what they did. But what was interesting is that throughout the time as they walked toward freedom, they kept on looking back. Even during the worst of times, uh, in Exodus 14, they get to the Red Sea, the, the Egyptians changed their mind and they wanted them back. And they said, oh, it would have been better if we were in Egypt and died there, not here. But God provided a way through the sea. In Exodus 16, they were hungry. They, 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 they didn't have the food that they were used to. And they said, oh, if we could only be in Egypt. In Egypt, we have pots filled with meat and all the bread we can eat. But God provided them food every day. Next to 17, they didn't have water. They complained about that. God gave them water. In Numbers 14, they're on the cusp, on the brink of going into the promised land. And they, they, 
the the spies came back and said, yeah, there's great, there's a great land, but there's giants and there's uh, big fortresses there. They said, oh, we need to go back. Life was so much better in Egypt. And it was a constant theme for them, always wanting to go back as if slavery in Egypt was a better thing than the life they now had. And so Jesus invites his disciples to share a meal, I think to remind them of God's provision and God's covenant and God's ability to bring us to a new kind of life that's different. And so that Jesus came and he set up the second point for us to think through is the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a remembrance meal. It's, and Jesus changed the meaning to a new covenant in a time of freedom of, and forgiveness with God. And so we, we enter into this relationship with God through Jesus. But it's interesting how longingly we look back to a life without God and to live a life separated from God. We so easily go back to the rhythms of a previous life lived, not the life that God has brought to us. And we place God as a small piece of our life instead of the centerpiece of our lives. See, our Christian faith gives us a new place and new ways of thinking and living and acting and reacting and feeling. Communion gives us a reminder of that. But somehow, by the way we think and the way we act, we longingly look back and desire that life of slavery again. So that's the second point. The third thing that kind of connects all this together for me is that we are now in a season of Lent. And I think we've forgotten that in the midst of pandemic and sheltering at home. We've forgotten that this is the season of Lent, a time of preparation, a time of confession, a time of forgiveness, a time of transformation, a time of giving things up in order that we can let God take a hold of more of us so that we can learn new rhythms in our life and a new reliance upon God. And so with these three things, I want to come back to the question, do we really want to go back to normal when all this is over, when the sheltering in place is done, as we slowly get back into the life that we lived? Do we really want normalcy? Now, I've heard and I've done my own complaining about what life was like. We've complained about distractions. We complained about busy lives that were just much too busy. And we complain about this and we complain about that. We, we, we fill our lives with a dissatisfaction with our lives. Do we really want to go back to that normal or is there a new normal? Do we really want to go back to the life that we say, ah, you know, I just don't have time for God. Not, not as much as I'd like. I, I really don't have time for my family. I'm just way too busy. I don't have time to linger with God. You don't know my life, how packed it is. Well, now we have a chance. For many, we have more time at home. We have more time not running to and fro, more time not in traffic. What are we going to do with that time? And when our shelter in place Lent is over, are we going to go back to the way things were? Or are there new rhythms that we can learn? Do we really want normal? Or could we begin now doing a shelter in place Lent and create a new normal? a new rhythm that lasts beyond. This is not a temporary vacation from life, but maybe it's the beginning of a new life, a new freedom in Christ, a new reliance and trust in God, maybe a new purpose for the church in our lives. I wonder if Jesus meets us during this time and says simply, I have earnestly longed to be sheltered in place with you. Let me just give you one example of what I've been doing is generally I wake up and my mind gets going. And as much as I want to linger around the house and spend more time just in prayer and scripture reading, I run to the church and try to figure out what I want to do next. And it's just so refreshing to be able to not only um, do my devotions and get things done, get something done like that, but to lean my head back and close my eyes and just invite Christ into that place without feeling I need to rush off to get something done. That's a rhythm that I'm going to continue uh, throughout um, when our new normal hits up. And I hope there's other things. So here's what I want you to do. Let me invite you to do this. Write down five things that uh, you can do more if you like, but five things that you cannot do right now 
that you used to do before the shelter in place. Just begin to create a list. And then out of that list, begin to cross off the things that you don't need to have in your life and to begin to think about what those new rhythms could be. I think this could be a good time for us, church. I wish we never would have had COVID-19. It's hurt so many people in so many different ways. And, and I know that God is, is strong enough to handle that in each person's life. But I think for all of us, we can take this time and just learn something new. Change a rhythm. Uh, draw closer to God in a way that we haven't to, be, to rely upon God in a new and, and more powerful way so that our relationship with him is completed, um, more complete, and I think more powerful when we come out of this. As we close, I've invited Graham to come and lead us in, in sharing the Lord's Prayer. And we don't do this a lot at church, um, and, but it's, a, it's just such a significant prayer, a significant prayer for our spiritual lives. So Graham, could you lead us in this prayer as we close? This may be the new normal for us for a time, but we still look to our God and our King. As we close our time together, I would encourage you to um, follow along with the Lord's Prayer, a powerful prayer that Jesus had taught his disciples. It begins with, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As we uh, close in worship, um, I've heard lots of references to being connected, and maybe you aren't feeling connected. And so I want to give you some ways that you can be connected. This is our texting service, uh, so you can join our, our text. Um, send us your, you can join by following that link. Or if you have an email address that you would like to share with us, drop us an email at judsonchurch at ameritech.net, and we'd love to add you. We send out uh, regular content that we've shared on Facebook, as well as different events uh, happening online um, and announcements from the church. So I encourage you to do that. Um, there's still an option to give online. I know we are not together passing the offering plate, um, but God has been good to us, and if you feel led to give to the church, you can do so by going on our website. There's a little tab on the screen that says online giving. Um, you can do that there. Um, and finally, one thing I wanted to share with you is starting tonight. So we're going to be starting a ladies book study. It's not going to be long. We're going to be using the platform called zoom.com. Um, there's the information right there on your screen, how to join our meeting. I'll be sending that out uh, through text later. Um, we're going to be using a book that um, called the Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness, um, and it's a really short read, um, and um, I was talking to a friend this week, and she said it was a book that changed her life, um, and so I would encourage you to check that out. There's lots of ways that you can grab that book, um, order on Amazon, listen on Audible, download on Kindle. We're going to go through just the first chapter tonight at 6.30, um, and so if you don't have that, you could grab it this afternoon. It's a really short little uh, booklet to the whole thing uh, to listen to an audible. It'll only take you about 45 minutes. Um, so you could easily prepare for tonight's uh, discussion. I would encourage you to join us for that. But today has been a little bit messy, a little bit broken. Um, and isn't that how we are as humans? We are broken and we are messy because we need a great savior to redeem us and to make us whole. And so as we go into this week where the days are long, I just encourage you to look to your Savior who will make you whole and will put all the pieces back together. Um, let's just pray together. Father, I praise you uh, for what you have done today. Um, and Father, we may feel a little uh, bit broken and a, like we've had lots of errors. Um, and we know that we um, that's just life because we are broken individuals. And so we just trust uh, this into your hands, that you will take our broken pieces and you will use it to do big things uh, for your good and for your glory. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us.